We work in a world where communication and informed consent, and I'm afraid litigation, is becoming more and more a part of everyday practice. And if we as a Royal College are setting standards for the future doctors, we actually have to put an examination in place which is relevant to what they're going to have to do in their everyday life into the future. And that is why we have realised we cannot just go to places and hold an exam. We have to provide education in the form of our prep courses before people take the exam. So we have done many prep courses in India. The last one I was involved in was a few weeks ago in Kerala, and we have done prep courses in Chennai as well, and there are prep courses planned for the fairly near future. Our prep courses are different from revision courses, for example, in anatomy. And I know that people want to feel that they have revised their anatomy adequately, but in addition to that, they need to do a prep course because the prep course tells them the technique which is going to allow them to pass the examination. It's terrible to see someone who has the knowledge and probably has the good clinical skills fail an examination because they were perceived as being rude or unkind to a patient or they didn't wash their hands or they didn't dispose of their sharps safely. But all these issues are covered in our prep courses. There is a great debate about the best time to take the Part A. And we suggest in our syllabus and our um, pamphlets about the examination that a young doctor should probably do at least one year of internship before taking the examination. However, the really bright candidates will argue that when they've just passed their MBBS, that is the time when they probably have the greatest breadth of knowledge. And I am aware that some candidates will take their MBBS, have a bit of a holiday, and almost before they start their internship, or very early on, they will take the Part A. Now, I also know that those fast-track type of students will then want to take the Part B as soon as possible. But I really advise against doing that too soon. And there are two reasons for that. Firstly, that you only have four attempts at the Part B and that the clock starts to tick from the time you take it for the first time. We do have all sorts of exclusions to the clock. So, for example, if a woman takes time off to have maternity leave, her particular clock will be stopped for a year while she's doing that. But it does have to be done within a certain time of the first attempt. Now, People can learn from books at any age, and we've all seen child prodigies who have an enormous knowledge. But actually, the second part of the exam, we are looking for clinical skills in addition. And my point, and the point of my examiner colleagues, is that sometimes we have very knowledgeable people fail because their clinical skills have not been honed. So it re really is the thing of practicing how to examine a patient, practicing procedural skills, practicing putting in sutures and tying knots, and what are the very basic skills of a surgeon. And that cannot be learned from books and can only be picked up from clinical experience. When we do prep course, we spread it over two days. Most of what we do is have mock OSCEs. Now, we will probably take up to 25 candidates at a time, and we would hope to be doing between four and six of these courses in India in the coming year. Um, if there is demand, we can do more, but we need to have the courses full to cover our costs to run a course. We will have two faculty, usually from the UK, and local faculty up to six or seven more who are MRCS examiners with our college who are based locally. So day one is a couple of lectures, most particularly the first lecture explaining to the candidates the difference in an OSCE based examination from almost any other type of examination. And from the feedback I see, I know that the candidates find that this is very valuable. We may do a very brief run through of what you need to know for anatomy and communication skills and then we get the candidates into small groups. It's generally a group of four. 
and some of the feedback from the candidates is that they would much prefer to have the course where they have individual one-on-one -on -one. but our point is that it would be incredibly expensive to do that but also it is amazing how much you learn from the mistakes that your immediate colleagues make so for the first OSCE of the day which is usually by about half 10 or 11 in the morning some poor candidate is surrounded by people of his her or her own age who are strangers and has to perform in front of them as the day goes on they all get their turn to perform and by the end of the second day they're usually within their groups a group of friends they're used to performing in front of other young people and by the time they come to the exam then and it is one-on-one -on -one, it's actually less embarrassing and in some ways less stressful so there is a real balance between providing a course which is affordable so we do have to have this but also there are advantages to making them perform in front of other people we do do practical skills and many of the tips we give them are things that they've never thought of so for example if you're told you're going to be tested on your suturing skill and there is a patient there you will get marks for things like safe disposal of sharps and for making sure you've got the right patient so there'll be a consent form there so it's a very practical course which is designed to the OSCE on day one we'll do the communications and we will do um, communication skills and some of the surgical skills on day two we'll concentrate on suturing telephone communication pathology and intensive care and then we have feedback from the candidates and what we do during the whole two days is encourage them to interact with us they're very like scared little mice at the beginning of day one and at the end of day two we can hardly stop them talking well as with every institution we have to develop uh, modern ways of getting information across so we are developing various areas of our website we do have an e-learning department but we've also been developing webinars we have webinars which are live at a time which is difficult we know for our Indian candidates to watch but every time there is a webinar which may happen in the evenings English time we will have the webinar supervisor available online the next morning in English time so a very accessible time to our Indian candidates to discuss issues on the web at the webinar live then any webinar we do is archived so anyone who signs up to our college um, the webinars are free and open access but if people want to look at the archive then they have to sign up as an affiliate of the college that's only 15 pounds but it gives them access to all our information and our learning resources and basically it's a question of go and look and you'll be amazed at how much is there we do have for example Ackland's video anatomy and we do have very soon uh, next week in fact we're going to have the, the digital human on the website where people can go and they think well I'm not quite sure about this part of the body they can go in put the arrow in there and search and have a look at what exactly is going on behind one organ so that they can get a much better idea of the 3D of the human body and this is something which has never been, a, been, a, been able been possible to do in the past with books but now using modern technology it's coming and we've got it. I hope that's what you mean by e-learning. Yes. There are various courses yes. where people can sign up as well.